like to call to order the November 4th, 2021 meeting, regular meeting of the Ketchikan City Council. Clerk will call the roll. Zingy? Here. Gage? Here. Bradbury? Here. Matani? Here. Flora? Here. Gas? Here. If you'll all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ketchikan City Council would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional first peoples of this land in Ketchikan, the Tongass Clinton people. <clears throat> and we have a resolution, actually. So is there, is, is there actually a uh, yes. public hearing to go with this? Yes. Okay, so resolution number 21287, amending the 2021 general government operating capital budget to provide a supplemental appropriation of four million seven hundred and twenty-three thousand eight hundred sixty-eight dollars and a public health department in the amount of one hundred and eighty thousand dollars. Does anyone wish to speak to us on that point? Seeing none, we'll close that public hearing. Uh, before we get to actually communications, we have a couple of things laid on the table here. Uh, more additional information concerning the court for staff. Um, okay. Next, before we start, um, I'd like to give the floor for a couple of minutes to the acting city manager she wanted to discuss our lovely new chamber, our lovely new chambers with all our lovely new people. Uh, thank you, Mayor Hayward. Um, welcome back to City Hall. The council chambers, everybody. Um, part of the process and getting back to this room involved kind of a Herculean effort and a number of staff members in both the city and EU. I just wanted to take a moment to recognize all of them. I'd like to recognize, of course, our clerk, Kim Sander, our deputy clerk, Taylor Lee, uh, Colin Combrick, and Aaron Schultz for all of your work, um, as well as building the maintenance to pull together this project. Even though it might not look too different, um, there's a lot of behind the scenes work that took place to make the WebEx uh, possible here in Council Chambers as well, all the screens and the interface online. So if we can please give those folks a round of applause for going above and beyond to get us. Mayor Dave, there is a feedback of everybody's microphone on. If there's everybody off until the speaker, we'll hear one voice. Thank you. It doesn't work. I don't think it works that way, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't have an off button. <laughs> there's, a, there's an echo. We will try to deal with that. But most of the sound is coming from back there. So that keep in mind, there probably will be until we get this dialed in a certain amount of, of feedback. So. I hate too much money. Okay, moving on to persons to be heard. Who do we have now? The first speaker is Pat Davis. Hi, Mayor, Council. Uh, I'm Pat Davis. I do building maintenance for the city. I sat on the last uh, negotiations team for the city. Honestly, it blows me away every time I see these meetings because there's such a massive move of money like that. And uh, the issue for us is that we're not even receiving the end of that. Uh, and um, I really had a lot to say about a lot on the issue. But uh, I think coming to a resolution uh, to work it out is it's needed. We're going to start losing people if we're not brought up with the cost of living. Um, it's hard to do for us today, your workforce. Everybody in your workforce, all over the city. Um, and I want to propose uh, if we could what it would look 
like to tie our cost of living to the CPI in Anchorage. What would it mean? I mean, that's what it's there for. It would help keep us up to par and able to stay here employed with you guys. Any questions? that employees earn and working for the city provides for the, us the ability to afford to live here and maintain a good quality of life for ourselves and our families. These contract negotiations will let all of our community members see what the city values based on those issues that the city chooses to prioritize and support when it comes to its employees. If you only have room in a budget to compensate some employees, but not others, when a wage study is carried out, what does that say about who is valued? If you are only able to look at addressing rising cost of living and fair equity pay, and fair and equitable pay, when it's been a wage fall year, what does that say about what is valued? If the care of employees working every day to provide services for the very communities that we are also members of, can be removed from these important discussions about equity, what does that say about 
how a catchy fan engages with its values. I hope that the city council won't be discouraged to make decisions that help us all actively go toward our future future's ever been again. Uh, so thank you again for the time that we're going to all spend together. Any questions for Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Stevenson. I can be a pistol, I know. But you might appreciate it. Maybe. I'm here for resolution 212827, $4.7 million, the Port of Enterprise fund to get them through May 28th. I have clarified that the commercial passenger vessel fund current balance towards tourism related projects is not changing its current balance is approximately 2.16 million dollars that is not in jeopardy. What is being considered is the C P B A R P A fund, which is going to be $2.7 million for the Port Enterprise Fund. How they came about it, what was the balance, what was the check made out to, um, I haven't gotten a square answer from City Hall today. However, I'll let it pass and assume that it's legitimate. I do want to address the NCL. Norwegian Cruise Line gift of $2 million in a May 4th, 21 letter from Mr. Del Rio, President and Chief Executive Officer. This was to come to the community as a hardship that they may encounter during the pandemic. This gift follows a tradition with city manager's office, a lack of transparency with the community to hold the check for six months without public vetting and letting residents decide how best to use the gift is unacceptable. We need that money for restrooms for the NCL patrons. If council approves this transfer to the Port Enterprise Fund, it should be amended to acknowledge it was a gift to stakeholders and it should come back as a payback plus interest um, within four years, 2025. This is a gift to the port. We want it back, simple as that. It should be noted that the city manager's office made her arrangements with CLIA Charlie Wall to not collect passenger wharfage fee of $9, and it was a decision not to collect a passenger fee from the ward shuttle um, Cove shuttle. Port can't pay its bills if it doesn't collect it from those who price the ticket too cheaply. It should be also questioned whether Ward Cove paid port for the dock they used for one loading zone. Similar to the three companies who participated in the dock vendor program who paid their fees to put their buses on there. Did Ward Cove pay a fair share as well? My question is, probably answered, no, they didn't. So, Port, if you're asking for money, you should have made the effort to go across the board and start collecting it on the passenger fees from Ward Cove and all the 80 ships who did a port stuff. Number five, there's only seven. Um, 2021, Port Enterprise Fund revenue is $1.335 million. It could have been more if they didn't give a free ride. Number six, that $4.7 million is just a band-aid for the port, who will run out by May 2022. What mechanism, tell us right now, no surprises, start working on it. I want to hear what mechanism is in place to start generating costs that will start up paying payroll by monthly insurance maintenance contractual agreements this dole out right now is permanent 
There is no come back, we're still short of money. In my opinion, it's time to revisit our relationship with Survey Point Holding Company, as they are the port managers for Cash Can. Council knew when voting no action status quo, Survey Point would continue managing the port earnings of contracts and concessions from cruise lines with no obligation to fill the RFP offer of millions of dollars that was on the table that would have come to the general budget. And when looking over the port director's job description, it's very clear nowhere in his paperwork is he handling any kind of paperwork that Survey Point is doing for us. They are definitely the port manager, and we're not getting any revenue off of them. Has the city considered approaching Survey Point for a financial aid package? It doesn't hurt to ask the guys who are making our port money as a loan. Thank you. Any questions for Thank you. You're welcome. Dan Keaton. Hello, Hello. Hello. Mayor, City Council, Advocate Manager Citizen, staff. My name is Deborah Keaton. I'm the Executive Director of Rose Kitchen Can and the Economic Development Organization. So I'm here to talk about priorities. I sent to all, all the council members and have been interested in an email on Monday about a new grant that's, well, it's not new, but a grant that is, uh, I don't know, suddenly, that's true, that would be. It's the Economic Adjustment Assistance Grant from the EPA. It's part of the American Rescue Plan Act grant that came out last July in which the government gave $3 billion to the EDA, which is distributing through these fire six grant programs. This is one of them. And this is one for infrastructure. And when I first read this grant a couple months ago, I didn't think it was involved in catch I looked at it and thought, well, we have these sewer and water projects that we really want to get it done. But they're just the course of ordinary business and they don't relate to a disaster and that's what this grant is for, is for things that are related to disasters and like COVID. And it wasn't until at the last council meeting I heard that those projects had been put on hold because we didn't have enough revenue because of the COVID disaster. The light bulb went on. Aha, there's a connection between the COVID disaster and our infrastructure needs. So this grant suddenly looks like it will apply to our infrastructure needs. You can get up to five thousand million dollars alone. We will entertain other uh, applications higher than that. Now there is considerations and pluses and minuses for applying for this grant. One of them is uh, our city staff is stretched and may not have a lot of time and effort to put into. Putting together a fairly complicated grant. It's more complicated because it involves all of the, the engineering and things that have to do with it. As you have to do first, grant, audit, every. So that might be a consideration as to whether the city wants to apply to this or not. On the other hand, the Congress is considering $1.75 trillion of funding that they are voting on funding, we hope, that it will include infrastructure. We don't know what form that's going to come out in. Although there have been a nice history recently of funneling their, their, when they vote for something, funneling it through existing agencies in the form of grants. They came out with one from S through SBA, couple of billion dollars through them a few months ago, and now this one through the EDA, through their grant programs. So I expect that we can speculate that they never get done money on this one point five billion, then it will also get funneled through some existing agency grant programs. 
the argument for even for including this economic adjustment for systems grant is you already have the grant done that you can recycle when the 1.753 comes down the pipe. And you'll we'll be prepared and you'll we'll be first in line for that next round. So that's one reason to do it. I'm not going to say against the staff and what their constraints are and what decisions they want to make about this grant. But that's a good reason to put it together now because you might have a chance to get it. The EDA says that not any of the amount of money that's been allocated to the Seattle District Office has been obligated yet. So it's all sitting there for the grant applications. There have been quite a number of grant applications, but there's no indication of what criteria they're using to go through those applications. It doesn't appear to be worse down the reserve right now. They have let us know if there's any point system. So we don't really know how they're shuttling through what they've already got on the table. In my opinion, it doesn't hurt to put another one on the table in front of them and see if we can get this back. Several million dollars. That's tax money we don't have to spend on these. And infrastructure projects. So that might be an argument we're going ahead with. I'll just leave it up to you folks to discuss that with your staff, weigh the pros and cons, and then decide what it will apply for. My theory is if you don't ask, you don't get. And if you don't get it, you can always use it again in another context. I've been doing that for a long time. Recycling. And that brings up, you know, this is how much of a priority it is. If we have our resources strained and don't have money to put this together, is this a big priority over some of the other things that are taking all of that time? So we have, and I want to talk more about priorities here. At the last meeting, we discussed the tourism grant. And there was some discomfort with the idea that it always included a restroom. Well, this wasn't something that I had chosen to present to you. This was a priority set up by a previous city council. If you look at the capital improvements list for the city, under the tourism and economic development, Section. The number one priority is the Thomas Basin Promenade. The number two priority is the Stedman Street restroom facility. Now, those may not be the priorities now. This was from a long time ago. It's not, the promenade is in the worst. It ain't took 30 years. Yes. <laughs> The restroom, somewhat less than that, but still, it's a long time that it's been sitting there. And no one's really re examined it. And we've heard uh, negative comments about it. If you don't want it on the priority list, now's the time to revisit those priorities. Anybody looking at this and looking for a possible grant project for the tourism grant? Would it be out for those first two priorities as the, as the possibilities for that? And that's why that proposal came to you the way it was. It's because it was a city priority set up many years ago. It's been sitting there for a long time. And nobody could you know, we couldn't anticipate that there would be objections to it at this point having been in place for so long. Personally, I don't think the Russians are in the right place. I don't think it costs much. I would rather not have that go forward, but I think it's in the city priorities. So I would ask you to readjust your priorities, review, and this is going to come up from Kajan and Sarina in economic jurisdiction, community wide strategy. And we're going to be wanting community setting priorities for what kind of 
new business development we can do here. We'll be doing and uh, asking the various groups to give us their assessment of what our strengths, our weaknesses, uh, our threats, and our opportunities are here, and, and what can grow out of that, and then to ask us that their priorities as to what we want and where we want to put our money and our actions. And so, so it's time for the city to do a similar process. There's the, the capital improvements list to decide which, when, when merits come, come down, down, what are we really going to buy for? So that we don't pile up fleets and then find out later that there's big objections to something that's been already said. So, that is the final point. Go ahead. Yeah, in that room, we have the project that here. When you do your grant, you have to have a project, the one grant you talked about first. The big grant for the infrastructure, you have to have a project that set in stone at that point for that grant. It's, it's a what? Um, the one on the infrastructure, right? Um, do you have to have a project in place ready to go? No. no. Get back. Okay. We can go to the paragraph I sent you. It says it is for you can do engineering and planning. It says show ready with an Obama administration buzzword. And these grants will allow the planning and engineering. So the grants are at last could be much well I have marked that grant and you were able to get it. That two million $4 million dollars could have been applied to any project for them to no. It had to be restored. It had to be restored. You know, we would have to tell them, oh, it's a good promenade. Yeah. Okay. And if the promenade didn't have to be all in the years and ready to go, there was room for us to do the work and where we were going to go and all that. So we could have been in the bathroom. <laughs> Okay, here's the scenario. We get the money, we the money, okay. and we look at that for a situation. Well, we don't want it there. We don't want to lose it like that. We could change that. Once you have the money in there, you can say, oh, well, if it is good enough, it doesn't practice. It didn't work out. We decided to revisit it and redesign it. And let's see what happens. We still have to find the balance between the money and the money. And you still have to have to have the balance. <laughs> you actually yes. said you would. Yes. Or get the money back. That's know? what I'm getting out of that. You know? It doesn't set the project and spend. You know? You just have to come along. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. We would give them our money that we have and say, you know, this is what we want the money for. This is what we think it would cost. And even when we get it, you decide you don't want to do it, you can give it back. You know? <laughs> it doesn't. You're not that good. March 2nd next year. Actually, that really isn't the hard deadline. Here. But they want you to apply by then. We're already a bit late. I mean, more than a bit late. A lot of grant applications. So that, and that argues against taking a lot of time in it. Um, Deborah, so you brought forth that uh, contract last week for 12000 for the two grants, so the bathroom and the yeah. promenade. Um, what does the price on the project look like if we were to go make for all three or just the infrastructure? I know the infrastructure requires a lot more steps, um, items to get it ready, but I'm just wondering what, what are the dollar signs around? I haven't made it a proposal. Involved with the economic city would like that, me to help with talk about that. Any other questions for Ms. Hayden? Thank you. Check, you know. I don't know if that'll go high enough. <laughs> <laughs> Honorable Mayor, 
council members, city manager, staff. My name is Chet Hugo. I live in the city. I have been employed by the city for about 14 years, as of October. One more year will be 15. Um, let me start by stating that I like Ketchikan. I love Ketchikan. I love my job. I like working for the city. There are a couple factors that I want to address tonight, and that is specifically pay and retirement. In 2019, there was a wage study done, and the administration or unrepresented positions were given substantial raises, specifically as seen by those that are represented. Those were large dollar amounts that could have really changed our lives. We were told at the time that that would be that the non that the represented people would be addressed at contract negotiations. It is now several years later. Inflation has gone up. A number of things have happened that really has hurt those working for the city that have not had that pay increase, um, and they're suffering for it. We are suffering for it. The other item is retirement. When I started with the city, accrual rate with the union pension was over 4%. Economic conditions in the last 14 years have changed dramatically. Currently, my pension accrual rate is just over 1%. That is one quarter of what it was 14 years ago. At the current rate, my retirement looks to be just slightly better than unemployment. These are some serious issues, and they are some of the reasons why we have trouble maintaining staff employment. Um, do you have any questions for me on these issues? Any questions? Thank you. Ortiz. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Honorable Council Members, Hacking City Manager. It's a pleasure and honor to uh, speak to you this evening. My name is Dan Ortiz. I live at 3204 South Tongass Highway, and I'm the uh, current state representative for District 36. Tonight, I would like to uh, bring your attention to another opportunity that's out there in the future. It looks like it will be. I'm sure many of the staff are aware of it and probably many of the council members are aware of it. But the federal government is um, acting like they're going to pass an infrastructure bill. We're waiting, um, but it does seem like it's going to happen. And in that infrastructure bill, there is a significant amount of money for renewable energy projects. and. At the last Southeast Conference, their annual conference, which was held in Haines, I did not attend, but I attended uh, virtually, and I know that the uh, acting manager Simpson attended, as well as perhaps other members of the council were there. Um, and there was a presentation done by the AEA, Alaska Energy Authority, and they talked about uh, renewable energy and the prospects of how there will be significant more uh, financial opportunities for us to develop, uh, for communities in Alaska to develop infrastructure for charging stations of vehicles, uh, so electric vehicles. Obviously, Southeast Alaska is blessed with hydroelectric power. Uh, it's relatively cheap compared to other energy sources in the state of Alaska. And uh, it's just, it's a tailor-made place for electric cars. I have to be it, state my disclaimer, I drive an electrical vehicle. So um, I'm not just looking for myself, though. I'm thinking that, you know, down the road, it's pretty obvious that, uh, you know, there's going to be more and more of a turn towards electric vehicles as we move into the future. And it seems like uh, the city of Ketchikan and the borough uh, need to take this opportunity uh, to see if we can uh, harness some of these uh, federal funds that will, will likely come in order to develop um, some electrical vehicle infrastructure stations here in, in Ketchikan. And so I just wanted to bring that to your attention tonight and um, 
and hope that uh, you will give that some consideration. And finally, um, I would like to invite you all uh, to a town hall meeting, which I will be um, hosting on this coming Tuesday back at the Ted Ferry Center at 7 o'clock. Um, and I'll be updating the community on uh, the state's uh, fiscal situation, uh, the permanent fund, the dividend, and uh, be willing to answer any questions that any people in the audience might have about topics related to those kinds of things, as well as to local economic issues, tourism, fishing, those kinds of things. So I um, encourage you all to be there if you can, and thank you very much. Questions for the members, please. <clears throat> Mr. Ortiz, uh, since you drive a electrical vehicle, I would just like to ask how, about how many miles per charge do you get on one of those? The one that I drive, I can just get kind in the, of a standard. Yeah. In the summertime, um, I can get up to about ninety-three or ninety-four miles of charge. Wintertime is a little less than that. Um, I'm sure the folks here would have a better idea why that is, but it's like down to 67, something like that, uh, and during the winter time. So I guess kind of my, I'm scratching my head going, if we've got, what, 28 or 30 miles of road, would it really be practical to put in public charging stations? What would the, I'm just a little curious on, why well, would that be practical? Well, first of all, my vehicle is not state of the art. There are vehicles that are coming out every year that get more and more capacity for charge. Mine is a 2017 vehicle, and um, and uh, I, I I've been hearing you know the updated versions of that particular vehicle is now I think up to 100 110 miles something like that. But I can speak from uh, from my own experience that with the vehicle that I have, um, it's almost always ample for my needs. Um, you know I happen to live at about three and a half miles south Tongass. I drive back and forth. Um, once in a while, you know, I have to think a little bit about it if I'm going way out north to make sure that I have enough charge. Um, but um, I think if there's ever a place that would be tailor-made for electrical vehicles, it would be a place like Ketchikan where there is a limited amount of roads. Uh, now, obviously, you probably might need to have a second vehicle if you're looking at road trips and things like that. But, um, you know, so I think it's tailor-made. I think I misframed what I was getting at. I was kind of getting at the point is, if there's 30 miles of road, you go home at night, you plug in your car, you're not going to drive 150 miles, so why would we need uh, government-provided ones out on the road? I was just, it's just a thought, but it sure. seems that if you plug in sure. your car at night, you're going to definitely have enough charge. Sure, but yeah. I appreciate that thought. You bet, you bet. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, do, you do you use your vehicle in general? I do. Have you, have you, how long does it take to charge it? Fred it depends what kind of station you're you're at. The ones that are like public stations, they charge a lot quicker than the ones that we have like at my house. So it's a higher wattage. Is that what it is? You the electric guys. Um, anyway, um, so when you charge at these public stations, they charge much quicker. Like I can do a, a station down in downtown Juno that will get me charged within an hour. Um, so a full charge within an hour. And so, what do they charge you for that? Nothing. Nothing? No. Oh, so they do like Portland? I, yeah, I guess. Portland. Yeah. And they, they have, there's quite a bit of infrastructure in place in Juneau. If you go out to the pool, out the one that's out, out the road there, they have charging stations there. They have charging stations down by the library. They have charging stations um, and a, few, a couple of other areas as well. So then, do they have any cats that do that? Do they have any? Any other cats? I, I do not know that. Because I know they got the bus, right? The electric bus. Yeah, I believe they have an electric bus. That's correct. Yeah. Any questions from the members? Real quick ones, as you mentioned the infrastructure in the hall. Are you getting any sense yet, assuming something will eventually at some point pass, is it going to be going primarily to the states for them and then to disperse? Or is there a chance for us to sort of, because frankly, if, if we see $25 billion hit off the DOT, I'm not sure we're going to see any there. Why, why, why would you say that, Mayor? Um, in any case, um, I believe that there's going to be a combination, of both some that uh, will be directly accessible by communities to the federal government, and then some will be dispersed through uh, the state. I kind of think it's going to be both of those things, um, rather than all through the state. But that's just my, from what I've heard, and that's not concrete. So, but, you know, 
even if it's dispersed by the state, there's a chance. But you have to. Well, be, that's your job. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Any other questions for the presenter? Thank you very much. Rana, that's the end of our first speaker list. We'll move on now to the consent agenda. Um, looking at looking at other items to put on there, it didn't look like there was going to be anything that was really. Uh, we just slide on there, so I guess we'll just have the consent agenda as originally suggested by the schedule. Clerk will re I'm sorry. Do we need to get, get a? Move to consent. Sorry. Second. <laughs> Clerk, please call the uh, discuss the. Items. Thank you. Uh, I think they had a couple of Okay. Your Honor, approval of minutes, City Council meeting of October 14th and 18th, 2021, and the regular City Council meeting of October 21st, 2021. Marijuana license renewal application for Pete Analytical and the Stony Moose, a budget transfer telecommunications division overtime, and changeover number two final to contract number 2025 continuation of the water meter design bill business and commercial customers, Ketchikan Mechanical. Any discussion? Here we go. Clerk call to roll. Gas. Yes. Gage. Yes. Yes. Ziggy. Yes. Bradbury. Yes. Flora. Yes. Matani. Yes. Motion passed. Just in general, so we're not sure about the mics. We're not just we, we well, sure. That, you know, <laughs> emote. To the back of the audience. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not that far. Don't press the We're not the civic center. We're, we're not going to call CMU. Don't press the Yeah, don't touch that button. Don't touch that button. Are you touching the button? I thought yes. I was on it. <laughs> he wasn't here when we were discussing that. Oh, oh, now it turned everybody off. He turned all He turned us all off. I kept seeing the green, so I kept pushing it. I kept turning it back. Okay. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, we thought there was, I was thinking there was a malfunction here for our... <laughs> that technology is our friend. We need it all. I was kind of worried. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fix this one. Okay, moving on to item 7A1. Uh, budget transfer, harbors, division, salvage, and disposal of the impounded uh, charitable team. Yeah. Yeah. I move the city council authorize the acting city manager to transfer thirteen thousand three hundred and thirty-three dollars from appropriated reserves to the Harbor Services Fund and fifteen thousand from within the Harbor Division's twenty twenty-one infrastructure maintenance materials account number five one five point zero five to the Harbor Division twenty twenty-one salvage and disposal of impounded property account number six two zero point zero one. To fund the costs associated with raising and disposing of the FVC spree. So I got that. Second. Discussion. Your Honor. Yes. Sir. I guess I have a couple of questions on this. One is, who's going to end up paying for this? I'm assuming all the harbor users. Why aren't we charging? Why don't we require people to have insurance, or at the very least, pay some additional fee? Uh, so that they're not all paying for this. Looks like the uh, Ports and Harbors Director, I'm sorry, Acting Ports and Harbors Director, uh, has, we would like to weigh in on that. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mark Hilson, Acting uh, Port and Harbors Director. Um, that's an excellent question, and it's one that uh, has come up before. Uh, so, Council actually uh, deliberated on that issue with some ordinance changes that were proposed back in 2011 when uh, Title 13 and 14 was extensively revised. And essentially, um, the thought was, hey, why don't we, why don't we require insurance um, to, to deal with this? And at first blush, it seemed 
like a good idea. You know, maybe maybe boats sh uh, boats should have insurance. Um, then it quickly was realized that a lot of these boats can't be insured. So depending on the hull, the age, other factors, uh, boats that are in uh, the harbor today would never be able to get the insurance. Uh, so then the discussion turned to, uh, you know, could we have an additional fee, such as what you mentioned, if you can't get um, insurance. So um, that was uh, talked about, discussed at length, and what it came down to was it would put the um, city essentially in a, a de facto insurer position. Uh, so we would be collecting a fee, and then the implication of that would be people who did have insurance could just pay that fee if it was cheaper and be covered in the harbor. Um, so that the approach was uh, considered in terms of an insurance and then and or a fee. Um, and then uh, ultimately the council decided not to adopt that, that proposal at that time. Um, now whether or not you, you know you may be proposing an additional harbor fee for everybody on top of that. Um, but in essence, um, if we're not able to recover the fee for the, for the salvage operation, um, you're right. It's all the harbor users that would have to cover that. Um, so in essence, it's the same thing. I think there has to be a better way to do this. I mean, we shouldn't be responsible for this. It should be the boat owner's responsibility. We need right. to figure this out. So we looked at this in 2011. Um, my understanding is we should look at it again. If I were going to ask Councilmember Flora, who's on the course at Harvard's board, um, if he has any comments on this. I have a couple of I'm sure it's going to come up. Uh, this week, it's going to keep it done at that point tonight. Um, obviously, we could spend more time then flushing this out. But here's one concept for consideration those who can insure their boats show proof of insurance. Those who cannot show proof of insurance either have to present a short bond or they can pay a premium. And then, yes, the city would then have a self insurance fund for the high risk vessels. It's a discriminatory way to do it, but if you've got a two-year-old boat, it isn't going to say you can get insurance for the right price, go do it. Council members think that's right. All we're doing is we're leveraging these expenses on the back with the folks who are paying harbor fees, and the guys that have a 90-year-old wooden boat sink escape. So um, I did not see a Board Member Gray sent something right before the meeting. I didn't have a chance to look at yet, but um, I do believe that this should be revisited and whatever was uh, deficient in the ideas from 2011, maybe we can improve upon them. I, I would add that it is an agenda item in the Port Harbor Advisory Board meeting Tuesday night. times do we have to um, salvage a boat? That's, that's a great question. Um, similarly to this, it's happened about three times um, since 2009. So this is not a new issue. No. It's been going on for decades. It's been going on for every harbor in America, or in the world probably, for decades. I remember part of the discussion, this goes back 20 years, was, well, we need to make sure the boats are at least movable. Yeah. Does the engine work? Yeah. Theoretically, you're not going to have a boat that's going to be totally just. But obviously, even requiring that, it still happens. I mean, I hear a lot of concepts here, but like I said, this isn't, this isn't just invented here. You know, is, some, is there somewhere else where it's working? If so, we should follow that. Or we just have to accept the fact that, frankly, this has always been a problem, it always will be a problem. Someone's always going to stick us with cleaning up their boat because we're hard to tell. Yeah, I, I, if I can, um, I think that's a good that's a good point. Um, there are two harbors that we're aware of in Alaska that have some insurance requirement, um, but neither seem to really fit our situation. 
and I know Juno does it, um, but they've dedicated, a, my understanding is they've dedic dedicated a full-time staff member to administering that program. So, um, you know, I would encourage you as, as you think about this um, to consider um, what the cost of, you know, do, dealing with this periodically versus setting up a full program. It's, it's substantial to, um, potentially substantial, depending on which way you go with it. Mr. Is there any way we can incur any of this money from the owners of the sea mm -hmm. Yeah, that's our intention. Um, so typically when something like this happens, um, you know, of course they get billed, uh, not only for the salvage operation, but also the, the reserve mortgage that they're behind in. And then they, um, you know, will get sent to collections to get it collected. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a, a recovery percentage, you know, that um, you know in collection activities, but that would be our standard procedure. Well, I kind of answered. I was going to say one of the simplest solution be when this happens, they change our contracts or paperwork to say that if your boat sinks, the bill comes back to you. But it sounds like that's kind of already in order. So. Yeah, that's what we do. Yeah. In most cases, yeah. Have we ever collected? You say we had three times have we collected money from the other three. Um, I'm not sure uh, what our success rate is on that. Um, I would I would have to check. I guess what I find frustrating about this is that it's always on the city. We're always okay with us putting up the money. I think we do have to sometimes go back and revisit these things and see if maybe there's a better way. Maybe there's other communities doing this. Maybe somebody else has, you know, they already are working on it. Um, so I'm glad it's going in front of Boys and Harps, and maybe those guys, I mean, they're far more experienced than me on this. And they can look at it and maybe come back with some solutions. But this gets frustrating, you know? Just saying. Uh, since there's only been three, since 2009, if you averaged out the amount of money that was spent over a period of time, figured out how many years in between, is it possible to add a, a percentage of the fee for the use of the port that would go into directly into a fund for these kinds of incidents? That would be paid, unfortunately, by the entire. But at the same time, it, it, it it's a short, smaller fee versus a huge astronomical fee. Um, yeah, I mean, sense? certainly, you know, setting fees or designating their use is within the purview of the city council. Um, that would be um, that would require an uh, amendment uh, to the municipal code. Um, there's there's different ways to address that, um, but ultimately that that solution, you know, any kind of additional fee that's assessed across the board essentially comes from the same so places. Or say 1% of the fee that people pay to port their dog or put, put their boat in goes towards salvaging if, has, if this has to happen. I don't know. I'm just... Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment on that. That's certainly an option that, that we can explore. The trouble is that the city is accepting that we will be paying. Uh, even though Harbor Years is paid into that fund, it disincentivizes people from being on the hook for paying those costs because they know that fund is there available. So that's just the negative side of having such a fund set up. Yeah, I, I think you have to be wary of putting the city in a position where you're the de facto insurer for boats sinking. But that's definitely not the position the city wants to be in. Well, and, and I guess... Uh, a, when we pay the fees, we already are the insurance company. And then take it one step further, it's the harbor users that are the insurance companies. The people that are paying those fees, in reference to raising the fees, it seems to me we had a three years in a row in the harbor, did we not? Not that long ago? Did we have harbor fees that... Uh, I, I think the increase with the bond issuance is my uh, recollection of that. So, it, it, that's, I don't agree with that mechanism because now we're asking people that 
harbor. Right. 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 If there are municipalities that are doing this, that it doesn't fit the catch and can model, I believe it would be more exploring if there are elements that we can take um, and see if we can find a way to keep the city whole and not punish those who are responsible vessel owners in the process. I understand it's not a, it's not a every month it's not an every month thing, um, but I think it's still worth exploring. Speech. Well, I guess the way I was thinking it was kind of like the when you have the vehicle removal, like you know, somebody, not everybody, like they may have been able to afford their boat at one time. They lose a job or they they have some financial issues, and that's where usually things go right. And I guess in a way, is there like a what? How does the mechanism work when you have a dead car in your yard? And every year, you can have one dead car removed by the borough. We pay for that service, correct? I mean, I don't know. That's maybe another way to look at it. Um, remove one boat, I like that. <laughs> and there's some yeah. take four or five years. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it's like the, you can go to the borough, sign up, you have the, and then they would tow it, and it goes to the, the car dump. Um, so it's 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, this this kind of thing is terrible when it happens. Um, I would, my, my best advice is to be, we just have to be careful in, in trying to address this granted infrequent um, occurrence by not setting up something in terms of a, a, a new program or bureaucracy that then winds up more burdensome than the original problem. And, and I understand Council Member Flora's um, concern that you know, the cost causer should be the cost payer. And that's a good principle to try to adhere to. Um, so I'm sure we'll be discussing it more at the Port and Harbors Advisory Board and we'll look into uh, what some other specifics of some other communities and what they're doing see if we can come up with something but it's a it is a difficult issue any other questions <laughs> further discussion on this item click or call the roll right there yes flora yes Katani? yes gas yes Gage? Yes. Zinni? Yes. Moving on, we have the annual comprehensive. Oh, I'm sorry, that's right. Uh, keep you staff would like a short break to see if you can figure out why I'm going to have a broad test. So, we'll be back shortly. Yeah, do you have any Yes. Yeah, mine died too. Mine died too. This guy is back hopefully we, we moved our microphones around and made some adjustments hopefully people can hear us we're going to try to speak loud a little louder so that the audience can hear us because i guess we're not projecting out to you guys we'll see hey technology it's our friend okay moving right along the annual comprehensive financial report for the city of ketchikan alaska and the supplementary compliance report section for the year ended december 31st 2020 your honor I move that the City Council accept the annual comprehensive financial report of the City of Ketchikan, Alaska and the supplementary compliance report section for the year end December 31st, 2020. Second. Moved and seconded. And I believe we have a presentation. This, can you hear me? <laughs> we can just hear you. Not when you do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, speak, 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 speak to me. Um, so, it's not really a presentation, but I just wanted to make sure everybody had a copy. We, in finance, um, this is one of our babies, um, the budget and the CAF, the annual financial report. The, it is now changed. It's no longer CAFR, it's ACFR. Um, so we'll try to get used to that term. So if you hear it, ACFR is the more appropriate term. But um, these financials, 
every person, every department, every employee that purchases, um, collects revenue, uh, has any financial um, implication for the city, whether in any department, um, has an effect on this financial statement. So we appreciate everybody's efforts every day that they put into any purchase order, any invoice that's processed, all the revenue that's collected. Um, and of course, the finance staff, I have to thank our finance staff for all the work that they do every single day to put time and effort into helping us get this document ready. Um, so uh, there's also a compliance report, which is electronic. Um, that was provided in the packet. Um, that shows all of our grant revenues, financial assistance that we've received over the last year for that reporting period. So if you have any questions, one thing I would like to point out, obviously the financial statements, there are fund level financial statements. So each fund that we budget for has a financial statement in this book. Um, and then in the back of the book, it's a book, <laughs> um, there is a statistical section. I think you guys would might find this really helpful especially when you're thinking about, well, what have we done in the past? And there's 10 years worth of data in some of these tables. So I think it's very helpful when you're looking back at past information, statistics, customer counts. Um, so if you have any questions, I would welcome any questions. And um, our auditor is here to also give you some information. So I'll let him speak. And then if you have questions, then I'll come back up. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I'm Kelly Priestley. I'm one of the partners with Tusher Walpole. We have a, a local office here in Ketchikan just off of Tongas Avenue. And every year we come in and, and we do an audit. And as Michelle had mentioned, and I know that there's a, a couple of new uh, council members here that maybe haven't gone through this before. So just uh, real briefly to just make sure that we we kind of level set and make sure that everybody's on the same page and understand what it is exactly that we do uh, if you you look at that that little lovely report that you have there in front of you it's it's 200 plus pages and we review that uh, we review not only the financial statement uh, money side of the city to make sure that all of the assets, all of the liabilities, all of the revenue, all of the expenditures and expenses are appropriately stated and appropriately allocated to not only the, the government-wide financial statements, but to each individual fund as, as required by regulation and as economically what, what happened in each fund. So we look at that. We also review the compliance of the city, meaning you have various grants, you have various regulations, you have various uh, stipulations from money that's received from various sources. And part of our audit is to go in and to make sure that for any of those significant items that the city is complying with the requirements of the given grants. And, and we do that not only for grants that are received from the federal government, but also grants that are received from the state government. And so a, a little bit of that report is, is the compliance report that, that was sent to you electronically. Uh, in addition to that, we will also go through and look at the internal controls and the processes that are in place by the city to make sure that all of the compliance and all of the financial statements is handled efficiently and appropriately. So when you, you think of, well, what, what does the city audit mean? It's really those three elements. We look at the financial statements, so the money. We look at the compliance. Are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? And we look at the processes to make sure that you have the capacity to do it correctly. With all of those uh, elements <coughs> included in the audit, 
I will say that uh, the city of Ketchikan does a fine job in, in complying in, in each of those. Uh, Michelle and her team are, are excellent. They, they do a great job. She is uh, technically competent and, and very precise in, in making sure that they're doing it correctly and that they're, they're doing it in accordance with the requirements that they have. Um, she does a very good job with that and, and we, we certainly enjoy uh, working with her and, and with her team. It, it's it's a, a good working relationship. As far as the audit is required, there's just a couple of, of items that, that we're required to communicate. And, and you have that uh, electronically in the required communications. I won't read all of that, but just to highlight a couple of items. Uh, one, we issue several different opinions on, on the city's audit. One is the financial statement opinion, another is an internal controls opinion, and then we have a couple of compliance reports. All of those opinions were were what I would call clean opinions. There were no matters in those opinions that are required to be brought before the city council for you to address some error or deficiency. So that, that's a good sign. Um, I would also say that there were no items that came to our attention as a result of our audits that dealt with fraudulent information, that dealt with, with any illegalities or, or anything like that 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 you would be required to address on a legal basis or on a on a ethical basis of any form and so that that's also good news as far as uh, the working relationship with the management team although I work very closely with Michelle um, we actually work for you 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 this body is is who we are employed by and who all of our reports are addressed to. And so if there are specific items that, that you would like to talk to us about, uh, we are certainly happy to have that conversation. All of the reports and all of the information that we work on is really at the request of and for the benefit of, of the council. And so that, I think that's a, an important thing to make sure that everybody understands with that. Um, there's no uh, serious disagreements or, or disputes or anything like that that we have with, with the management team, either uh, Assistant Manager Simpson or, or uh, Michelle and, and her team. Um, in any audit, there's always discussion, there's always uh, consistency, there's exchange of ideas of, of the way things uh, we have an idea, they have an idea, how do we make sure that we, we come to a resolution. That's normal in any given audit. Uh, but there's nothing significant that, that would require a, a comment or, or anything like that. Um, I, again, uh, the, the city does a, a fine job. You've got a, a very good finance staff to, to make sure that they're doing what they should be doing. And, and as you can tell by by the size of the annual report, uh, it is a, a lengthy process and certainly a lot of work that's, that's put into that. Uh, I'd be happy to, to entertain or to take any questions that, that you might have. Any questions from the council? <laughs> that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> understand. It's coming. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. Very thank, good. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Matani. Yes. Gas. Yes. Gage. Yes. Zingy. Yes. Bradbury. Yes. Flora. Yes. Okay, the next item, uh, item 7K3, undesired activities at the Main Street parking lot, Main School lot. There was a, uh, a report from staff in the uh, 
in the packet what is what's the wish that's coming. Mr. Guess. Well, I guess I'll start on it. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the uh, staff and the police department for the detailed report. I was kind of pleasantly surprised to see uh, that the officers have, in fact, been responding there on what appears to be a regular basis 52 times with multiple different incidents. I think that's uh, significant. At the same time, I think, as we've heard from the folks in the area via email and at the prior meetings, the concerns, uh, I think we also have an obligation to make sure that we stay on it and maybe turn up the heat a little more. You know, one request by some of the residents that we talked about was signs. Uh, obviously, that's not going to probably have a ginormous impact, but uh, no camping signs was requested by them. I think it's a reasonable request, could be done pretty cheaply, so could we look at maybe directing staff to put up some no camping signs up there as a start? Are you in screw that? And then, uh, just out of curiosity, uh, so, so then the question becomes enforcement. Um, we have the signs, then, then, then the enforcement, I guess. Uh. So, uh, Mayor Kiefer, like all things, we can certainly put the signs there. There's, there's plenty that prohibits uh, camping, my understanding, in, in such a lot. The issue becomes having probable cause for arresting someone and actually having the witness. So we have a sign there, but lacking a witness that says that it's that person, I saw them do that, or catching someone in the act. All of those things, the enforcement side of it can become kind of null and void. So putting signs there is certainly something we can do if directed, um, but it will not necessarily have a direct link with uh, uh, making you know a contact with a, with a suspect issuing a fine, arrest, anything of that nature. Mr. Floyd. I was still commenting. I don't know what the procedure is. I was still commenting. Oh, cool. ah, thank you. Ah, so I think that's a start. It at least shows the, the residents in the area that we're listening, that we can kind of throw them a bone and at least, and then also, it, uh, you know, I don't know, I, I don't track the police. Uh, they may be doing this, but, you know, uh, I've heard it mentioned that that could turn into one of the areas where the officers do their patrols a little more frequently. I'm sure they already do, but maybe a little increased presence would be good. And, uh, you know, frankly, I think, I think as a body, we should let it be known that, you know, uh, not to get sidetracked, but everyone knows we just had a bank robbery in our town. Uh, these issues that we've been talking about are not improving. Our officers are understaffed. They're new. We, we're all up to speed on that, but I think we need to kind of say as a body, or at least I would like to say that uh, it's time to turn up the heat on these folks who are doing these things. As Lacey said, obviously we have to have probable cause, the officers have to see what's going on, but uh, to start turning up the heat on this activity, I think for us to let it be known to the police, I think that's appropriate. So at least for my personal say, I'd, I'd like to say that, but uh, yeah, we'll see what everyone else has to say. Excuse me. He is first. See, that's but what I thought, but he insisted otherwise. Yeah. I thought I saw his hand. I was telling him to be nice. Um, <laughs> To the manager's comment, I understand probable cause, but wouldn't probable cause exist if the police department were, for example, to patrol that lot several times in the evening, and if they find somebody in the act of camping, where it's posted that they not, isn't that enough of a basis to initiate action? So it's, I, just want, I just want clarity for the public. It doesn't require somebody necessarily calling it in, although they could. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's all. Thank you. Um, so, I'm just going to step in this. Um, we talk about how we're shorthanded, but in the last couple weeks, I've seen uh, cars sitting in Wolf Point 
um, probably about 20 minutes, three, three cars together, obviously having a conversation. They are not patrolling speed, speeders. I have, <laughs> um, I have been under the, they also hang out on birth floor. So technically, they could be hanging out on Edmond Street. Um, also, we have cameras on uh, several trails, I believe, Schoenbar Trail. We have cameras in uh, on the berths. We have cameras in various areas. Maybe we need a camera on Edmond Street. Because the other piece to this is we have people who live in that neighborhood, not necessarily in the houses, but in the apartment building, who also do not feel safe because they have to park in that parking lot to get to their home. So when they get home in the dark, they they are very um, not very happy with having to deal with. And I did not like this statement about a private citizen can make a uh, arrest. I can see that going south real fast. Um, making you know making a civil arrest on somebody, um, creating a crime, and and then that person um, hurts them. And, and I think half that um, neighborhood is in the, I don't want to, they're, in, they're senior to me. So asking a senior to um, hold somebody so the cops can come do their job is not cool. And I know it's in the statute, but it, it, we could be patrolling the parking lot more. I think we ignore the parking lot because we don't want to deal with the issue. And I get that that nobody wants to really deal with this, and I know that some of these people just have issues, but at the same time, um, it, someone's going to get hurt. And it's either going to be people that are camping or the people that live there. Andy Berenson, Lieutenant or Acting Deputy Chief or Chief, depending on the day. Um, I think it's important to stick with what we know and not assume anything. Um, <clears throat> we had two guys, uh, three guys basically work 24 hours straight solving a robbery. Um, when that happens, we don't have time to patrol parking lots. That is just the reality of police work. I mean, we have priorities that we have to do when you see people <clears throat> Um, meeting and speaking in a parking lot. Uh, it doesn't mean they are not doing work. It often means they're communicating confidential information we don't want to put over the air. Uh, the same critique we get because of utilizing cell phones while we're driving. That is a lot of times why we would meet and speak in person. Um, I would say on average probably 90 plus percent of what we do is social work and dealing with these people is nothing we avoid. It is, it, it is actually one of the core missions of our department. Um, the issue you're seeing now is when you, when you target an issue like homelessness and everything that goes with it, be it quality of life crimes such as uh, theft, drug use, many different versions of disorderly conduct, whether it's creating an unhealthy environment, fighting, um, you have different things that you can do and then different things that you will do. The can is kind of defined by resources and the law as it's applicable. Uh, the will is then what plan do you have that addresses a public nuisance or a public problem that's brought to your attention. And in this case, um, <clears throat> you know, our department is, is fairly well versed in handling social issues. Um, we just don't have all the ability to, we can't make people be sober, we can't uh, fix a lot of these problems. Uh, but what our guys do uh, is everything in their ability to essentially teach the homeless how to be homeless. Uh, that might sound strange, um, but it's out of sight, out of mind. It's, it's places where they're not causing problems for other people. It's cleaning up after themselves. Uh, what you're seeing now is kind of a, an unfortunate trend in a younger group of homeless people that just don't seem to have, I think shame is maybe the best word, or, or a sense that there's any accountability. Um, 
most of the homeless people we deal with are very polite and kind, and you probably know a lot of them. We know them by first name. We bring them home if there's a place for them to stay that we know of. Uh, we interact with them on a daily basis. This last six to 12 months, there's kind of been a change, and I think you've all seen it. Um, there's a group of people that are increasingly ornery. Uh, they are not kind. Uh, and they're causing problems for our community. And I think some of the things that, that are in process, such as opening up the shelter uh, for nighttime again, will, that, will, that will help. Um, it's, it's a place for them to be. It's also a, a deterrent for their bad behavior because they need to behave to have a roof over their head and things like that. And so I think, you know, baby steps like that will, will push us in the right direction. Um, we have a person that gets a lot of grief in our department, uh, the, the parking enforcement <laughs> officer who we all know and love. Um, she spends a lot of time in that lot. Um, she tickets our guys when they park there for too long. I mean, she's up there towing, you know, marking and towing vehicles and, and communicating with the people up there and taking these complaints. I have to tell her to, to stop talking to people because it gets a little bit it's not always safe for her to interact with a lot of people, but she's out there trying to teach people and help people how to, how to avoid these problems. And so um, I can understand how it might look a certain way uh, to somebody who's not out there doing it, um, but our guys are working hard within their resources. I mean, we're down bodies. We have to prioritize what we do. Uh, our guys are actively patrolling uh, with minimum staffing, you know, two-man shifts. And so... When they come up on work, they have to go in and be accountable for their work and document it thoroughly. Um, that's that's just part of part of the game. And I, I apologize. I just don't agree with your assessment of of that situation, at least from our department. But I I understand I understand the critique. Um, it's just not one hundred percent accurate. The reason I brought it up, and not necessarily my point of view, is because that's the complaints I'm getting. So what I wanted was for somebody to, which is what you did for me. Sure. So, um, because that's been what I've been hearing. And it's hard to explain to people. <laughs> and, and these things are predictable. I mean, when you see this type, these types of complaints, I mean, they come from folks that <clears throat> either are living or frequenting that area. So it's, and frequenting is generally a, a place where they get resources or a place they hang out, or be it a business or somebody's home, um, that's attracting those uh, nuisances and parking lots attract vehicles and, and junk vehicles and some of those become homes. I think part of the issue with camping, and, and Mitch would have to correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not sure we have an actual definition of it in the catch Cab Municipal Code, and I think it's only attached to parking and the public or the city manager has a lot of discretion within city parking lots and I think if we just but to your point of if we find somebody camping right now I my understanding is it's only a parking violation there's no arrest authority there um, we can hang a ticket on them um, if we if we have a good definition of camping um, it's I think it'd be pretty easy to, to, to make one but um, you have to make it an actual city misdemeanor to have any kind of enforcement power as far as affecting an actual arrest therein lies the perpetual cycle that we get in where most of these quality of life crimes have zero or very little bail attached to them. So you're dealing with when you take these people to jail, um, you're displacing them for sometimes 45 minutes from wherever situation they are. So it brings me, so what's, when's the shelter going to open? It is, it is currently open. It's open. <coughs> It's, it's in the Methodist Church. Yeah. 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 Yes, it, it, it's, it's, it's not open yet, obviously, on, on Park Park Avenue. But if we displace these people enough, and if you go up there and you, you know, get them to move and take them to the shelter, um, doesn't that encourage them to move on? You know? Absolutely. That's why they're not at birth three anymore, because they're right. up at the parking so, lot. We chased them out of birth three. You know what I mean? So it's... it's um, no, you're right. I mean, it's it's moving the problem. It's right. not I mean, it's correcting not, it's the not problem. Helping, it'll, no, but it's yeah. be some, it'll but be they, somewhere else. But there are things that help. Lights help. You know, signage and enforceable ordinances help. I mean, there's there's things that you can do to so help I guess nuisance issues. What do you need from us to help that situation up there? I'm not. 
I'm not sure you can do much. I mean, you like I said, lights and signs and, and, and applicable ordinances. Um, it, you know, as far as I mean, you're. you're you don't think patrolling more would help? Oh no, absolutely. That's I mean, oversaturation is, and that's and that's what we do. And I'm just kind of explaining you the reality of. I mean, we can do circles in a parking lot all day long. Um, <clears throat> the problem is then they wait for us to leave, and then they come out and affect whatever. And 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 there's a little mischaracterization as far as um, citizens arrest. We citizens arrest is a is a long. It's just was highlighted. No, but I mean, it just bears some explaining, right? Yeah. So a citizen's arrest, and it's kind of explained in that memo, that the actual way it's affected isn't, I have yet to see anybody put hands on a person to affect a citizen's arrest. It's generally a different form of a statement, whereas we can utilize that process by them keeping a subject in sight, and it still fits within the law that allows us to arrest a misdemeanor that occurs outside of our presence. So we don't ask old people to... If, you know, if they see somebody urinating in the parking lot, we don't want a 70-year-old person tackling a 20-year-old, you know, drug addict. I mean, that's not what we're out here asking well, the nice community. Have that cleared up for people who might get overzealous. I, 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 I think that is in there. So I, I, I think it was detailed pretty good. So. But that the practice isn't quite how it was explained. Mayor Kiefer and Council. Um, I just, again, wanted to reiterate that if the council wants this lot to be a priority, we can do what we can to make it a priority for patrol. But the council needs to understand that other things will not be the priority because we do have limitations with our staff. The best thing that I think folks that are in that area that have concerns is to call dispatch when they see the concern. That's not happening. So we hear about these things, you hear about these things secondhand, and it's too late. It's too late. And the cycle continues. So encouraging people to call dispatch when they see something that is of concern. Our guys will go there. They'll absolutely go there. There's no hesitation. Unless, of course, they're on something much more serious. But if they're available, they'll go there. What about lights? It's pretty well lit, I believe. Um, I mean, maybe there's areas where there's not, and we can we can look at that. We can certainly look at that. Also, too, the law of unintended consequences um, is we're finding in other parts of the community when we boost lights for either crime issues or other issues, then we tend to hear from residents about why are these big honking lights on? And you say, well, it's so no one gets attacked in that park or on that trail. And they say, well, it's keeping me up at night. Or, and so once again, yeah, I, I think that I've been there a couple times now. Late at night, not late, and it probably could use a little more lighting in that area. But once again, if we if we, we put some big Klieg lights up there and fire it up, yeah. you know, we're going to be hearing from the same people who were here before saying, you know, it's too bright. Right. So. I guess for me, what I'm hearing at this table is we want more patrol, we don't have the staff, so we as a council can look at the budget and figure out, can we make one more body happen, or you know, what can we as a council do to get that extra patrol? Um, and I do want to piggyback on another comment that a council member made, is constantly keeping them moving is better than them getting comfortable in one area and causing damage in that area. I know from experience of downtown that there was a time the police department let them run amok on our property. I mean, nothing was stopping them. Patrols weren't stopping. They were just, it didn't matter at that point. Um, but once we got them just constantly targeting, throwing away their stuff, just keep moving, they eventually we're like, well, you can't permanently stay there. So now, I mean, we have one or two that come around maybe once a month. Nothing near what it used to be because we were constantly just moving them, moving them along. And so um, I, I think that's important, but it then, again, we need staffing to keep them moving. So it all comes back to the key, key we're point looking here. For staffing, right? We're still looking. We're trying to fill those <coughs> 
We we have I'm three, not the one to we answer. We have that. three frozen positions okay. with the place from. We do have additional vacancies, so we're we are able to work on those. We are getting some of those filled, um, but the the issue of the frozen positions is something that the council wanted to discuss during the budget mm -hmm. process. Yes. Yeah. Yes. How many positions are we short in the police department right now? We're down four. We're have four vacancies. We're down eight bodies based on eight bodies. Two at the academy and two with long-term injury issues. So when you say four vacancies, is that four in addition to the three that we froze? No. Okay. There's three. There's a personnel okay. issue and there's a or personnel decision and then there is a those four that just aren't available. So I get the academy ones coming back. The other two are just on long-term disability, of some sort, or is that not long-term disability? They well, I mean, we're talking months of, of bodies that, based on injuries, they're not able to work full duty, so they're off our schedule. So we're we're down eight bodies. Yeah. And how many? Just 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 comparison. What what what's, what what was the normal staffing size? How many how many officers? Oh, we were slated for uh, it was 25 or 26, I can't remember, based so, on the budget. essentially a third. Correct. Okay. That's important information, because people yeah. need to understand that out there. That we're, just, yeah. we're not just missing a couple of folks here. We're well, and, that, and there's no saying, I mean, we, we have been targeting that area. We are doing our best, and, yeah. we, and, we, and we will continue to do it based, but, I mean, this isn't, manager's correct. I mean, we need the information real time. We, it, doesn't, yes. it doesn't do good, you know, anecdotally the next day or, or I mean, we need a real time to be able to affect something. I'm going to wrap this up in a bit because yeah. we're starting to so ride three folks. So go, go ahead. I know that you know moving them around is sometimes the ideal, and then having the night nice to open. But I think also allowing them to have a spot where they can go where we're not throwing away their stuff and we're not, but getting, and then also having whatever services we can plug in there. Um, the, I don't. The know warming shelters were game changers for us. Yeah. I mean, okay. game changers. I mean, it kept, it kept people alive. Yeah. So it gave true. them places that we could bring them in the night. And I mean, that's been, I mean, you think it was bad recently. I mean, can you imagine not having that place that's packed, you know? So that, okay. I mean, that's a, that is an entity that we have always, completely supported uh, because I mean every dollar you put there you're probably saving 10 in police fire and, and hospital resources and so I mean, I'm a huge so proponent the park one opens, we should be really good. <coughs> well, we're not sure we'll I mean not. better off <coughs> certainly better off but. For, uh, any other questions for yourself on this one? Um, I'm not sure, did we give you a direction or other, 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 than, other than signage and possibly? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Staff and additional ordinances. Sign, sign, sign perhaps, and maybe, maybe, maybe look, looking once again at lights up there, but um, not, not, not going too wacky, out, not, not wacky on that because. Yeah. Okay. Would a neighborhood watch work? A camera? Yeah. yeah. I don't know if that's sorry, cameras is that <coughs> so we, we can we can cost that out. I mean there's gonna yes. be a definite yes. cost with that. Yes. And if if this is something that we explore, I have to say that it's not something that we have the staff to monitor. It's going to be a look back at it and there's a window of time in which that footage is viable. Um, yeah. So it's not something that we'll, we're going to look at regularly to see if something's going on. It would be to corroborate some other report. Right. Yeah, but we can, we can look into the video cameras. And I think also I heard mention the, the, the idea of making sure that we're up to snuff on whatever our camping ordinance is or, or whatever it says or whatever, you know, so we can determine out whether, whether you know, we're, we're trying to ban something we haven't actually banned. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to, to, to another quick, quick topic. <laughs> Analysis of separating the city manager and TPU general manager duties. Um, obviously, we had a discussion about this. I wasn't here for I guess I missed that one. Um, what would the council like to do? 
Uh, staff made a very, I, I felt a very cogent, cogent report on some of the reasons why 20 years ago that seemed like a good idea. What do you think? So one of the reasons that, um, I mean, I think there's a, for us now, the physicians can't to hear be, you. For the time being, I think the positions need to be combined. Um, I mean, the cost, we wouldn't have the money to separate them now anyway. But I think it was important to have this done so that the community could see this and see why it was done. I mean, the last time this was even brought up was, you know, back when we joined the two. And so they're the community, it's a different community now. People needed to understand why that happened. It's not uh, probably the perfect situation for, you know, some folks, but I think it's what we have right now, and I don't see a way um, that this is gonna change in the near future. It's just my opinion. I think it stays the way it is. I, I think that we need to if, at least see what we can, if we can actually find a manager that can do both and then go from there. But this, this definitely, that was my intention with this. Was we needed to see this just because it's been <coughs> 22 years, yes. And why it was done. Agreed. The only mitigating factor would be if, if a candidate could not be found that is capable of doing both functions. I had four individuals from the public speak to me about this. 100% of them wanted it split. Okay? And to be, I want to be respectful of their opinions. We can't swing it financially. We're going to have a discussion. I, I asked at that opioid meeting, please bring us some budget numbers for adding three cops. We're about to talk about an insolvent court fund. We can't swing it. And we just are in no position to go to the ratepayers and the taxpayers and ask for more. So I think we just have to go with the model that we have for now. I have had several people contact me about that. And what I caveat it by saying is, they're all old timers, <laughs> not age-wise, just people who were around in the 90s. And they raised some good points, but sometimes people benefit, or there's, there, there's a benefit to chaos if you like things going a certain way. And I really got this sense that some old time KPU folks who really wanted us to go back to the good old days when they didn't have to answer to the city manager. <coughs> and I'm not sure that's where we want to be. Because once again, I, as, as I mentioned several times, I remember those meetings. And I remember the fact that literally the council had to referee sometimes. And while I agree on one hand that it might be a challenge to find someone, what we're looking for is a good manager. And if we hire a good manager, and they hire good department heads, the manager we hire doesn't have to be an expert in, what, in, in running the utility. He, just have, he or she just has to be a good manager in managing a pe pe people and, and a joint, joining departments and juggling all those, all those issues. Otherwise, we as a council are going to get, you know, we're going to be back to, you know, two, two powerhouses butting heads in front of the council, leaving the council to try to figure out what's going on. And frankly, you know, I'm not an expert in utility stuff. I'm just not. Any discussion on this Yeah. Um, sorry, I have a lot going through my mind. I have a couple questions. Um, I don't necessarily know who the questions are for, directed to, or who would be the best to answer them. Um, but my first question is, um, under the current um, organizational chart, how does finance and HR handle um, the city clerk's issues or the city attorney issues versus um, the city or KPU issues? Is it they service the city issues first and KPU issues first before they handle an HR issue with, you know, the city clerk's department or the city attorney's department or kind of how does that work under the umbrella currently? So, both, sure, so, so both, 
both of those departments answer to the city manager's office. They, they service the clerk's department, they service the city attorney, but they work for the city manager's office. So the city manager sets their priorities. Uh, those are also two very small departments. So while they have needs, they're not often, and they are generally not at the same scale as some of the other city or QPU departments. Uh, okay. that question. And then second, <coughs> currently, I'm going back to budget last year, currently KPU transfers funds to the city to pay for the finance department use, the HR, the, all the combined mm -hmm. usages. Um, so why would that change? that avenue if the positions were split? It wouldn't necessarily change. Um, what the council would need to decide in that split is what, how does that actually function? Is it just adding additional positions to support a city manager and a general manager? Or is it building out both, say, the human resources department, the finance department, so that there aren't competing priorities when that single department is answering to two different managers. So those costs would still probably, you'd still have those interdepartmental transfers, so there would, there would still be um, that level of, of flow of, of funds between both city and uh, KPU. Um, that wouldn't necessarily go away unless you create two independent departments. If you create an independent HR department or city and KPU and independent finance department for the city and KPU, that flow of money stops and that's when the cost of such an arrangement gets really, really high. Okay, so currently under the um, structure, if, let's say, if you had an assistant, your assistant brought forth something and KPU, uh, one of the managers over there brought forth something, um, how is that prioritized currently? You said that those departments work for the city, so if it currently, if an issue came up with the KPU side, the city could say, well, we're the focus, this needs to go, and then, then you take this task on. So if I misspoke, so, so both the human, excuse me, human resources department and the finance department report to the city manager's office. So the city manager slash KPU general manager determines what their priorities are. So if, if I'm understanding your question, uh, KPU has, uh, let's say the electric division has a, a financial issue, and at the same time the public works division has a financial issue. So they're technically competing issues. It's the city manager that determines which one of those receives first priority. So the city manager hat would go on for that priority? Yes, the way that it's currently structured. If you had two managers, each manager would be vying for the uh, attention that the finance department could give each of those separate issues. Does that make sense? Even though it's a contracted service, so yes. ultimately any contract service, you if they work for the entity, that entity would need to be taken care of before any. It's not a contracted service. It's an inter interdepartmental transfer of funds, and I'm going to call on the finance director to, to better explain what that is. So in the finance department, we have two utility accountants. We have customer service reps that take payments for KPU payments at the front desk. We have an accounts payable department that processes accounts payable invoices, purchase orders, um, check requests, travel reimbursements for both KPU and the city. Um, there, you know, that's done equally as they receive them, they process them. Payroll. We have one payroll coordinator. They process all the payroll for all KPU and the city. So the finance department as a whole, we've developed a percentage, and a percentage of the finance department costs are net then allocated to KPU for those, basically for those services. But somebody, you know, there's two accountants that are specific to handle certain questions, budget questions, expense questions. Uh, telecom or electric or water um, so does that help <laughs> I could talk all day long but I don't think you really want to hear me all day no, long <laughs> I, get, I might not be clear on the, the answer I'm trying to achieve at this point um, 
I guess I can say where where there would be an issue as the finance director. I'm respond my my baby that I just handed out. I'm responsible for those financials. So if you start splitting up the finance department and saying, here's the portion that goes over here to KPU, and they do this, this council is agreeing to one procedure. And in, in the next election cycle, who is the next council member that's going to be sitting in the seat? Um, and, and then KPU, as a general, as a KPU manager that comes up and says, I want, I need this person in my department to do this function for accounting. So they come up here and they do that. And, and now, I, I as the finance director, I have no oversight because now they're under KPU management and no longer under finance management. So it makes my job I, much harder. And as a KPU manager coming to me asking for me to do something and then the city manager coming to me asking me who's, who's telling me what my priorities are for, for the finance functions. I guess that's what I'm trying to get at is you've, it's been mentioned multiple times that those entities currently are, even as a combined manager, are under the city manager's direction. It doesn't matter uh, their city department. So it was stated that the city manager, no matter what side of the hat he has to wear, the city manager makes the decision on the priorities. So I'm confused on, even if there was two separate people, um, why those services, why we would need to double those services when we could continue the same structure that we're at because the city manager would ultimately still make the decision because it's third. That's no. where it wouldn't. No. You would That's have where a it would split. city manager and a general manager each saying, Michelle, do this. Yeah. And they'd be right here in front of the city council saying, I want to Michelle my didn't do this. And that's what we used to have. And if you want to go back, that's yeah, fine. Really okay, point of order. I mean, everyone's just. <laughs> kind of chatting here um okay so that's what i'm trying to that's why i'm working through this sure okay <laughs> um okay so then i guess for me uh thank you michelle for sure explaining, sorry. <laughs> um for me i um i think it's imperative at this time with our um i don't want to say issues but our revenue sources both on the kpu side and the city side that we get full staffs to start focusing on those um, departments kpu has completely changed the direction of kpu with just one single department um, and i think it's grown to the size that somebody somebody needs to dedicate the 40 hours a week to helping promote that entity um, instead of in supporting the current managers that the current team members that are in that area to really move forward KPU into um, the next step and then on the side note also our second revenue which is the port um, we have major issues at the port um, we kind of all discuss well if we don't take the RFP we should go down this path well we're not even moving anywhere. There's really no discussions, and it's really from the lack of, you know, well, one, bodies. But if even if we had the current structure, they don't have the time. We've heard it time after time after time. We don't have time to do that. And if we don't, if one person doesn't have time to do that, and they're repeatedly telling us, I don't have time to service both of these departments equally, then maybe that was telling us that we need to look for more to be able to service both entities um, to what they need to be serviced at. And so for me, and I totally understand the cost savings and um, of the combination, but we are at a point that we can't keep doing what we're doing. Um, costs are going up, we have to start making our revenue go with that trend as well. So I, um, <coughs> And I've had many citizens reach out because I, I think I've been very vocal at the table here about what my opinion is in the situation. And I've had many conversations with people who think that it should stay at one. And I do agree with some things, but I'm still heavily weighing towards two, at least until we can get a direction <coughs> for our port, get a direction for telecommunications, make sure they have what they need. 
the port has what they need and move forward and maybe combine it down the road if um, both get organized and our revenue uh, gets to where it needs to be. So. Uh, Mr. Ford and Mr. That actually, Mr. Martani is not waiting. Do you want? Do you want? No, I'm no. smart. Man. <laughs> Mr. Foyle, Mr. Gasp. So this is where your responsibility as a council member is supposed to shine. You've been on the council for a year. You just said we haven't done anything with the port. Port of order. Can you reference the honor, please, Mr. Mayor? Good. Thank you. Good. Council Member Bradbury's been on this body for a little over a year. She's unhappy with the progress of the port, and I would like her to remind me how many how many ideas, concepts, and agenda items she's brought forward on the board. Let's not point of order. Let's, let's not point of order. Oh, oh. Let's not make let's not make this a personal thing. In the, okay, just let, it, let's it's, it's not going to help if we're, if we're pointing fingers at each other for whether for either perceived or unperceived things that have been done. Um, did you have another statement um, about the particular issue? Because we, because we, we, we've also slid in, into talking about the court, and that's not what we're talking about right now. Just one, Your Honor. The only other comment, I guess, that I can make then is if a council member, any council member, feels that splitting these is the best way to go for the city as far as revenue generation then I would ask them to actually bring forward their numbers, like staff did, and show us their actual tangible plan. That's all I got. Mr. Yes. Um, I think it be, might be appropriate. Uh, we, we got this really nice, um, I, I guess you would say, opinion from uh, the acting manager. Would it be appropriate to ask for some input from uh, the KPU side, from Maybe Mr. Bynum or anyone else who is representative of KPU is here. <laughs> See if they'd like to weigh in. I'm not sure they'd want to weigh in right in the middle of this, but. Uh, He's smiling. I mean, part of the. Oh, he gave me the no shake. I just thought it'd be worth asking. I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I, I also have heard both sides. And just like you said, I'm not an uh, expert in this field by any means, but I've heard a lot of good points to the contrary of. You know, to the other side, and uh, you know, quite frankly, I'm not sure which makes more sense. But uh, one kind of interesting uh, scenario that was given is, you know, with this statement that, well, it's going to save us 11 million dollars to keep the two separate. Uh, kind of the the comparison was that's like saying, okay, I'm going to go grocery shopping for a week, and I go through the grocery store, and I'm got everything for three meals a day for seven days a week and then somebody comes up to my cart and takes out half of my meals and says there I just saved you half your budget obviously that's kind of a simplistic way of going about it but if we don't have I just thought I'd ask if KPU anyone from KPU on the input but I guess not so I just think it's worth mentioning. Mr. Tom. I think there are both sides to this issue I've heard from people that are pro keeping the two departments together under the manager's umbrella. I've heard from people that want to separate the two entities. And we are getting opinions from people that work at KPU. We are getting opinions from the general public. I think it's prudent upon us to have more discussions and more be diligent to do more research on this to see what the public wants what savings we can attribute to keeping them under one department. I understand the fact uh, two heads going to a financial uh, director and demanding services as a priority. But for the sake of the citizens, we need to be prudent and we need to do more due diligence before we decide where we want to go into on this issue. The late Carl Amelon was a unique, unique individual who could do both. We don't have the time to hire a manager who will grow into the two positions because the needs are urgent, the needs are now. So I would propose we do due diligence before we 
take any steps forward in this situation. Okay, keep in mind we've got another agenda out here talking about we're coming coming up talk talking about going out for an RFP. Yeah. We need to know what we're going out for. You know, we can't if if if, if, if the council is not on board with there being a single manager, then we can't be look going out looking for a single manager. So this we need to get a sense here what the what the, yes. I prefer to see if there's someone out there first before we even go down this road. That's my two cents to it. I mean, like you said, it, 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 a manager manages it, uh, department heads, and we have great department heads who already know the job. So when you bring someone in, they got to learn from these guys anyway. So, you know, um, I'm willing to, I want to, and I, I hate to rush for a manager just because we're times of the essence. I want I don't want to go down that road either. And I've been I've watched Catch Can go down that road where they hire and we waste money on and we're like giving them the boot six months later. Um, I think at the end of the day though, we need to know how we're gonna pay for it. I mean it's nice to say that we need two people. And maybe we do, but we cannot do that right now. We can't afford it. I mean, we can't afford nothing. We're, we're scratching the bottom of the barrel trying to pay for cops. I mean, we've got contracts that, you know, we, our people come up here, they tell us, we're thinking of leaving. We're not getting paid enough money. So those two <coughs> jobs are big jobs, and I invite you to go out and look at headhunters and see what those type of individuals with those qualifications get paid. Because Mr. Amelon was a Billy Bargain. And we really need to think about that. Because, you know, we split these two jobs and then what? We go to people and say, all right, now you're, you know, we're going to raise your rates. Because now we've got a KPU manager and he wants X amount of dollars. So, I mean, now is not the time to do it. I'm not. I'm sure that there's an argument both ways, and I'm not even thinking about that, frankly. I'm thinking about how are we going to pay for it if we go the other way. We don't even know really what a manager is going to ask for us right now because, let's face it, it's an employer's an employee's market out there right now. So, I mean, I just think that we need to be out looking for one person. I'll see what's out there, and, you know, then maybe if we want to revisit it. But at the end of the day, we're going into budget, and we need to know where the money's coming from. And right now, we don't have a clue. So <coughs> I'm sticking with right now. It's one person. Uh, Mr. Mattoni, then Mr. No, I think I totally agree with both the council members. We need to get go out there and create this RFP and find that one person, and then revisit it later on. I agree with that totally. Councilman Ford. I agree. It's time to move forward in pursuit of a single combined manager. The financial realities are dictating that is the way to go. Mr. Gass. Uh Should we just take a vote on it? Well, we can't actually vote because we're doing er, Sorry, should we put it on the agenda to vote on for the next meeting? Um, the next topic. Yeah. 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 Next item. Yeah, we'll vote. I think we'll, we'll we'll see where the RFP goes, <laughs> and, then, and then. So we're just giving direction, right? I'm sure if you give a direction, it was northwest or something, southeast. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> we gave a direction, but I don't want to go there. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's. Uh, we've obviously had had a spirited discussion, so we're going to move on to the next item, and then. And we'll see. If we need to bring that back, we can probably discuss it during uh, future agenda items. Okay. Where were we? Um, yeah, hey, fun, fun stuff. What time is it? Yeah. Draft request for proposals, city manager, general manager, recruitment services. Your Honor? Yes. I move the city council authorize the release. The draft request for proposal city manager slash general manager recruitment services in substantially the same format as presented in the acting city manager's memorandum dated October 28, 2021. Second. 
move to the second discussion. We're all talked out. Okay, I we guess we are. Clerk will call the roll. Flora? Yes. Matani? Yes. Gas? Yes. Gage? Yes. Zingy? Yes. Bradbury? No. Motion passes. Five one. Motion passes. Okay, moving on to, um, oh yeah, resolution number 21, 28, 27, commanding the 2021 general government operating and capital budget to provide a supplemental appropriation for the port department in the amount of $4,723,868 and the public health department in the amount of $180,000. Chair will entertain a motion. From somebody. Your Honor. Yes. I move the City Council approve Resolution 21-28-27, amending the 2021 General Government <coughs> Operating and Capital Budget to provide a supplemental appropriation for the Port Department in the amount of 4.723868 and the Public Health Department in the amount of 180000 and establishing an effective date. Second. Move and second the discussion. <coughs> So I guess I have a few questions about this. Uh, I thought we had partners. I heard a lot about our partners. When the RFP was um, happening, we were told, no, we should manage our own port. We've got partners. They want to help us. They're going to come to the table. I base my vote on them. Where are the partners? We are supposed to have these meetings. They were going to, they supported us. They wanted to work with us. And I, that's all I've heard. Now, um, we're asked to take this $2 million and put it towards a port because we're going to have no money. So I guess I want to know what happened. We got the letter. They said they were there with us. And I based my vote on that, frankly. And so I'd like to know where they are. Well, you could argue the $2 million is from a partner. Well, I yes, guess. but not the partner who said they were coming to the table. Would you like me to address this? Sure. sure. I, I'm sure either one of us could, but why don't you take a while? Okay, I, I, I will start. Uh, so a while back, uh, the council gave direction to staff on uh, beginning said discussions with our cruise line partners. We have had, uh, since that time, just one introductory discussion in which uh, staff laid out uh, the port limitations and priorities for our cruise line partners. Uh, they were fairly receptive to, to what we laid out. Um, but as you'll recall, the, the, while we introduced the limitations of the port, at no time did we say we would like our cruise line partners to uh, how shall I say, um, provide some sort of solution that would cover debt service and other operational obligations of the port. I think they believe that the way that they do that is by providing passengers uh, that we charge that create a revenue stream that support those types of expenses. So what was primarily discussed and what uh, those cruise line partners, I think, are receptive to is the idea of how we spend those monies that are generated off the port as an enterprise. So be that capital improvement projects, uh, other tourism enhancements throughout the community, um, those were the things that that conversation focused on. Um, if the council wants to take a, a different direction, um, to have a conversation about how our cruise line partners can uh, help sustain the port financially um, while both entities are receiving very little revenue, that's a different discussion. I wasn't at those meetings, but given the manager's synopsis, that still pretty much sounds like business as usual to me. We'll bring you people. So let me see if I got this right. So then we're right back to, yeah, but the sales tax is great. Unless it's not. Or the other rationale, which I've never been able to wrap my head around, is the sales tax is great. 
and it's so great, we shouldn't do anything to try to get more from the tourists. So that revenue stream is so cool and so beneficial to this town, we should never pursue a mechanism to try to get more from tourists to alleviate some of the burden on locals. That has been one of the rationales. This has been, a, in my time on the council, this has been a five-year circular conversation with no exit ramp. And I've been saying this from the beginning of my time on this council. This model that we've been doing in this community has never been sustainable. The pandemic accelerated to get us to where we are now, but the debt's gone up, the infrastructure's decayed, this has never been a model that works, and everybody that's defended the model of the restricted use of port revenue funds, I could write down a list of all of the entities in this community that are bound by the obligations of that business model. It's one entity. It's the city of Ketchikan. It's not the tourism community. It's not the folks at Ward Cove and it's not our partners on the cruise lines. It's such a fantastic business model, nobody does it. But it's imposed upon the citizens of this town as the best solution. And maybe I'm hearing it wrong, but I still hear basically the status quo with maybe we'll let you spend money on a bathroom of crossing guards. That is not going to solve this problem. The port fund's insolvent, and as Ms. Stevenson pointed out, it's going to be insolvent in six months again, too. And if we're doing the status quo, guess what? We don't have a $2 million gift from anybody on the horizon that I'm aware of. Mr. Yes. Well, uh, i trying to think about what I'm trying to say. Uh, on, those, on that issue, uh, we have to remember that we just had a season with 8% of the cruise ship business before that with essentially 0%. Uh, so, you know, while we find ourselves in a, a, a less than desirable situation with the port funds right now and in the last couple of years, I mean, we do have to acknowledge that it's because of the pandemic that completely shut down that industry for two years, essentially, with minus 8% for one year. So uh, I want to stay on topic with this. I mean, uh, with, with the $2 million from Norwegian, I would very much love to, to put it towards sewer lines or any of the, the huge list of, of other needs that we have in the community. Uh, but I think right now we're in get through this crisis mode with the hopes that 2022, you know, the projections, hopefully they're going to be there. I know coronavirus seems to just continue to go on, but I think the prudent thing to do is to put that money in the port fund and get us back to where we're making money again with the industry, uh, where our tour operators and shop owners are making money, but also that port fund is collecting revenue. So, uh, you know, don't get me wrong, I, I, I have lots of other ideas I wish we could do with that money, but I think it's the financially responsible thing to do at this point. And uh, I guess all we can do is hope that we have something more than 8% of the industry next year. But I, 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 I'm optimistic that we will. Yes. Um, I guess couldn't hurt to ask. <coughs> I mean, honestly, I mean, our partners are still going to get their $1.8 million. So they're not worried. But then we have to come up with that in another four months, right? Or May I ask a clarifying question? So which which partner are you referring to? So I'm referring to birth for so point. Okay, so Ketchikan Dot Company being a different partner than okay. the cruise lines that utilize the port for their business. So those are two different potential people to have discussions with. So 
but we but having that conversation with our our other partners that said they'd come to the table who sent us letters and when we were doing the RFP. Yeah. Because I haven't heard from them. And honestly, um, if we don't do the structure, we don't keep the structures up, they won't be coming. They won't have a place to dock. But it won't be up to code or whatever needs to happen. Mr. Mattoli. I think I have to agree with Councilman Gage. Uh, there is no harm in approaching Carnival, no harm in approaching Celebrity, no harm in approaching Royal Caribbean. They wrote us letters. I was in the public meetings. No harm in approaching them and uh, or get, uh, designating somebody from the staff approaching them. Hey, you, uh, you told us during the RFP process that you will anti up and help us. We have issues with our infrastructure at the port. And they've got major funding sources that we don't. Our funding source was port revenue and the cruise industry disappeared for two years. There is no harm in asking them to ante at maybe two, three, four percent. Norwegian did. Like on Royal Caribbean, Carnival, and Celebrity come to uh, the table. No harm asking. Um, and I might have overlooked this in the past, you know, couple months. But has the city sat down with um, the Bond Bank and or um, Catch Can Dock Company to, um, and I say recently, like in the past sixty days, even ninety days, um, to say, okay, this is our financial situation. Um, currently due to COVID and what alternatives are what alternatives are out there current like right this moment in the past 60 to 90 days versus I know we discussed this eight eight months ago I think now um, there was a discussion but it was totally different circumstances than what we have now um, and so I just didn't know if, if that conversation had transpired with either entity okay so um, I guess for me, before I would like to move forward with this, um, I would like city staff to sit down with both entities. Um, I have heard through the grapevine of other port, um, ports in Southeast Alaska that had bonds out that um, they have worked on a program to get them through um, 2022 until revenue has started um, coming into the city. To help relieve the financial constraint on the communities centered around um, tourism or cruise specific tourism and I just it might not be an option for us but it doesn't hurt to just see if something has changed um, to see if we have another option even if it's a 50% payout and then we tack on you know the other 50% in 2022 um, or you know what what does the potential options look like from both sides I know there was a contingency I believe in the doc 4 agreement that talks about if you couldn't pay there's you can push it to the next year and then there was a 5% fee on that did I read that right okay so maybe I mean that was written <coughs> pre COVID, but I don't know is there a possibility for that to look different now, I guess is what I'm trying to achieve. I would like to ask that the finance director discuss um, her understanding of our bond covenants with respect to BERT three debt obligation um, and what <coughs> may or may not be possible for that payment. Based on the current bond covenants, um, the options that we have were laid out in the um, in the LOT, uh, we we have a an R and R account. We can use that temporarily, but again, that's just a deferral of um, of the of, We can use it now, but we have to put it back. And so, the requirement is five percent of all revenues. So 
if we have a decent year or what we're projecting, that's another $500,000 that's not currently in the budget that we'd have to add to the budget. So it's 5% of revenues, not net revenues, gross revenues. So that's a, another big chunk. But, um, but, it, but it is an option to utilize that for the debt service. Um, the, as a last resort, they said the bond reserve fund. Um, I think as an even further last resort, asking the bond bank to defer, um, I mean, we can certainly pose the question to see what the, the effects th that would, how that would affect our relationship with them. Because going forward, if a municipality isn't able to pay their debt service, I mean, we're number four in line with the most um, debt outstanding with the bond bank. So if we, if we can't be counted on to make those payments, they're not going to want to give us any money going forward. And at, that can then affect, you know, all of the ADEC loans that we're trying to um, obtain. Uh, it could they have a revenue source in that any state agency that would give us money, they can attach that and say, we're taking that because we're a state agency, we're part of the state. So their remedy is to take all of our financial assistance coming to us and take it before we, before they don't get their debt service. Now, that doesn't mean we can't talk to them. By all means, we can certainly ask the question, but I think that that's, a last resort behind the bond reserve fund, <laughs> but um, um, I feel like I'm forgetting another option in there. But the bond reserve from what from our bond council was the last. They said as a last resort, you could use the bond reserve fund, but that's an even shorter time frame. You have to you have to replenish that by that would be this coming November. Sorry. Next November, <laughs> 22 budget year. So, okay. Um, so then, piggybacking on that, um, I'm sad to hear that conversations have kind of halted um, with the industry. Um, Actually, that's not entirely true. Okay. Um, I thought there was only one. There was one, and there, and, and, and we, we presented a list to them. Of the various pro local projects, nothing made, nothing, nothing on, on the sides, like yeah. but, but, uh, and they, and they are. It's actually the balls in their court. They said we will get back to you on on, on, on which of these we would like to participate and how we'd like to do that. So they haven't halted, but you know, we've asked. They've not gotten back to us. Okay. So. It seems like it's yeah, okay. Um, either way. Um, have we, and I don't know the legalities of this, so don't go after me, but is there a possibility, I'm just starting it now so I don't have an issue, um, is there a possibility to talk about, um, I know we've used this word before, preferential birthing in regards to pay for the debt. So for instance, um, Cruise Line A is coming to us they want preferential berthing on specifically Doc 3. Um, we say, well, this is your rate, but then you also are responsible for, you know, this debt or this improvement or whatever their mind creates. Um, is it a possibility to kind of look at that in terms of, one, getting some improvements done that um, somebody has mentioned that kind of needs to get done so that they could dock, if they want to dock, um, but then also kind of covers over that fee. I don't know if any of these conversations could happen. But. So, okay. Michelle looks like there, she has something. Well, I know it's in the lease, the birth for lease agreement. I just don't recall that there is a, a birthing assignment. So I, I know that it's. That's different. Are you, are you talking different. about our 2575? <coughs> I think I. Yeah, that, we're talking that, about. That we're, is, we're, yes. We're talking yes, about two different yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you still, I'm not trying to make things you still have to share, split it up, right? So you, can you provide preferential treatment if you have an agreement to share the birthing? Good question. I mean, it's worth an ask. Mitch? 
I guess what I'm trying to get to in this whole conversation is I think before we um, specifically the two million dollars that was donated um, I, I understand it you know if none of this pans out obviously that that's where it has to go so that we stay solvent but I'm just wondering if these discussions could happen prior to putting all that money in but I also didn't know if they had that money for it so I guess that's what it means here on all the conversations. Uh, hold on a second. Hold, hold on a second. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, my, my assumption is this is before us now is because we're looking at the budget in three weeks. So I guess the quick answer to, is probably no. Um, I'm trying not to become frustrated here because. One of the reasons why, unfortunately, this goes back to those lovely three letters we don't want to talk about ever again, um, was to avoid a situation like some of the other ports are experiencing, say, where they basically had to give a, give, give, give a large portion of their control of their port away to a specific cruise line for preferential treatment <coughs> in order to get money to do port projects. And this council very clearly, well, four or three anyways, very clearly said they did not want to give away any control of the port, whether it was to an outside port management company, whether it was to a cruise company. And we heard from the public that was an issue that was a problem. Um, if we are now looking several months later at giving away a dock in order for someone else to fix it, what are we doing? Same thing. So once again, you know, at the very least, we can be consistent, I suppose. Okay, um, I'm going to ask this for staff. Is it realistic to check A with our bond? Is, if there's any, if there's any uh, thing that we can do to, and then also, I guess, to call survey point. I'm sorry, uh, catch can dot company and see what they say. So yes and yes. Um, we have reached out to the bond bank with some of these questions to clarify them. I don't believe we've received a response yet. Uh, so that is underway, um, and we can try to uh, accelerate that answer. If the direction is for staff to have a conversation with Catch Can Dog Company about our lease, we could do that. Um, whether or not we'll be able to agree to terms in the next few weeks, that's the bigger question. Um, so that we can again develop a budget that's based on these assumptions of, of funds that are available. So if the direction is for staff to have a discuss discussion with Catch Can Dock, we can do that. I just need that to be the consensus. It's pretty good. Four four hands in that. Okay. So let's not go too far. Um, I'm sorry. You first, or I, I forgot. I was just going to bring up the fact that we don't have any control over the schedule. It's made by uh, another entity. We, we don't get to choose. <coughs> we don't make the schedule. No, we don't. It was one of the things we wanted control of, but we don't have control of it. I have a question for the manager, please. The birthing schedule is two years out, correct? It's, it's a two-year process. We're already working on 23, which so. then, if that is true, then any discussions in the near term regarding preferential birthing would not would, would be meritless, correct? Correct. Okay. That. And I, honestly, listening to this discussion, We had asked several times about the $2 million. It's the only unencumbered money you're ever going to see from the cruise lines. Let's be realistic. Uh, barring a paradigm shift, this is it. And I find it highly ironic that I'm actually going to support this. I would have preferred that the topic of the $2 million had come up prior to this event for the council's consideration. But here we are tonight. 
I'm not going to support any mechanism that creates more debt, more debt service to bail out the port fund in the near term. That is the least viable option. When you're broke, you don't borrow more money and, and incur more debt and more interest. Um, you I just put up my hand if you want to talk to Survey Point. That's that's great. In the near term, as distasteful as this is, I don't see a better near term solution than what staff has had. And quite frankly, if the community doesn't see the need for a non-status quo solution that we as a community can get behind, this is it. This is what this community will have. Um, I did ask the manager's office the other day for some longer term implications, 5, 10, 15 years out. Um, I'll remind the council that uh, 2022 was the year of 13 to 15 million dollars of cathodic protection. We're not going to do that. So now there's yet another infrastructure can, this one specifically for the port, that isn't going to be addressed. Councilmember Gass has an excellent point. Maybe we have something we don't know, but maybe we have something that resembles a normal year. And we get to the end of the year. What do the reserves look like? Is there going to be enough reserves to actually take on the cathodic protection? Or does that just end up being a 10-year project where we do a little bit and just fix the crappiest spots every year forever and never really do it the right way and spend more money long term to do a job that isn't as good? I, I hope, and I understand we're at budget season, but I hope down not in the not too distant future we have a more forward look at the long-term implications of what our decision as a community coupled with the pandemic, where that's going to leave us in five years, because I don't think, and, I, and maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think this, this challenge to port revenue resolves itself in 12 months. I don't think we have a good season next year, then we're, then we're okay. I don't see that happening. We've had two years of pretty much no tourism. I, I, I will defer to the manager and the finance department to, to provide the data, but uh, I think the long-term outlook is going to require a new way of thinking about the asset that this community owns. Further discussion on, I think, I think there was a motion there somewhere. It's been a while. It was moved by Zingy, seconded by Flora. So they are. No, no, that was pound. That's true. We're, 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 we're past this? Oh, no, we're on the rest of the show. That's right. Sorry. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> we're going backwards. Oh, no. No, now we're on the rest of Oh, no. Move to adjourn, quick. We're, we're cutting the time warp. Um, <laughs> Clerk will call the roll on resolution 21 28 27. Matani? Yes. Gas? Yes. Gage? Yes. Zingy? Yes. Redbury? Yes. Flora? Yes. Motion passes. Second, Mr. Florida said it's incredibly, it's incredibly painful to see that money go for this particular thing because it was money that could have gone anywhere in this community. It's a shame that's where it had to go, but at this point of the game, I have to stipulated it was a loan and a payback. It's the community money. Port. Okay, moving on to number seven intergovernmental agreement for emergency dispatch services between the city of Ketchikan and Ketchikan Gateway Road. Your Honor, yes. I move the City Council approve the intergovernmental agree intergovernmental agreement for emergency dispatch services between the City of Ketchikan and the Ketchikan Gateway Borough, effective January 1, 2022. Second. Is there any discussion? Yes, sir. Okay. Right
Okay, a <laughs> couple of points. This is a much improved agreement versus what we had. And I would refer to the memorandum that accompanied it, and I agree, while far from perfect, the rationale behind the formula makes a, a lot of sense. I do have a concern that North Tongass, South Tongass, and the borough have already approved it prior to this coming to this body. This body, not this body, this city, the residents of the city, are going to pay 94% of this bill. We get last whack at the pinata. I would prefer, in circumstances such as this, that these things come to the, the council earlier in the process, because quite frankly, I have a couple of thoughts of ways that maybe we could have improved this for the financial outcome of the city, none of which I will bother with, because our choices are to accept this agreement or to revert back to the one which isn't as good as what's being proposed. That's all I have, Your Honor. Further discussion? Mm -hmm. 77. Just echo what he said. Hearing no other discussion, click call roll. Gage? Yes. Zingy? Yes. Bradbury? Yes. Flora? Yes. Matani? Yes. <coughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Item 7A8, budget transfer, additional council member to attend the 2021 Alaska Municipal League Conference. Your Honor, yes. I move the City Council authorize the budget transfer in the amount of $2,400 from various mayor and council personnel services and wages accounts to the City Council travel and training account number 60001. Second. Move and second. Discussion. Hearing none, click the call roll. Bradbury? Yes. Flora? Yes. Matani? Yes. Gas? Yes. Gage? Yes. Zingy? Yes. <laughs> Moving on to <laughs> vouchers. Really? I move for the approval of vouchers to Parnassus Books in the amount of $77.80. Second. During the discussion, clerk will call the roll. Yeah, sure, sure. I should have to cut the gap. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't vote. He doesn't vote anymore. Unless it's a tie. I can't influence it, I suppose. You move that hammer around. Yeah, I'm just trying to do it. Yeah, I'm just trying to do it. Let's just make this easier. I'm going to hand the gavel to the other side. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. Gage? Uh, yes. Gas? Yes. Bradbury? Yes. Matani? Yes. Flora? Yes. Yes. Lunch. <laughs> Lunch. <laughs> Lunch. <laughs> Where are you eating? That's not a meal right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm eating a catch can. Okay, moving on to the manager's report. Uh, Ms. Simpson, what have you got for us? Uh, not too much this evening, Your, Your Honor. Um, I do want to note um, a memo provided by uh, Public Works Director slash Acting Port and Harbors Director Mark Hilson regarding um, an update on our wastewater permit and uh, discussions taking place at the state level with oversight from EPA. Um, it's, it's a little early to tell exactly what those implications are, but it is worth noting that there will be implications of a, of a concerning magnitude. Um, so we will keep the council posted on that process, just, just the news everybody wants tonight. That's um, right. Coming in is a problem, going out is a problem. Pretty much. Um, and then just lastly, uh, just a little quick update on the budget process, because today was our, our intended deadline to get the draft budget to all of you. You clearly do not have it. Um, we are hoping to have it to you um, early next week when we finish up the transmittal memorandums. And that is all. Mr. Gass. 
Uh, could we get a quick uh, latest update on the police chief scenario? Yep, so there is a, um, an item in, in your packet that outlines all of the... Oh, sorry. Uh, yep, that, that's so okay. There, there, we will keep that updated per council direction. Um, as you can see, we're doing quite a few interviews, so a lot of time and energy is being devoted toward those vacant positions. Um, we, are, we are getting close to finalizing the uh, chief of police process. Other questions for the I'm oh, sorry, assistant manager. Sorry, deputy assistant acting. Right. <laughs> yeah. This could be a, let's be a long year for two. Yeah. Can we just make it have one now? ACM. Do we do we do exit um, exiting um, interviews? We do. We do conduct exit interviews when uh, staff retire or uh, leave service. Did, was there something specific I'm just about that process? Of if it's something that we could get a report on, like, <coughs> like, like what kind of questions are asked, and then what are the responses? And I know that honestly, with the, um, I guess with the uh, rising cost of AML and <laughs> cost of living, um, we're really going to have to start addressing um, uh, wages. So. It would just be nice to have an idea. I mean, I know it's going to be a lot of the questions, probably. Okay. I'm just curious what the questions are. Okay. Is that the direction from the council? They're probably different given the different positions. I'm not sure there is like standards that question. Is I would have to defer to the human resources Their manager. Okay. Their standard. Okay, well, like I said, yeah, it's part of course. Uh, does council want the information? I wouldn't mind seeing the questions. Okay. Okay. We will provide that. Other questions for the manager? Hearing none, say clerk. How's that technology work? <laughs> <laughs> well, now that the mics aren't being turned, um, we're doing good. <laughs> Actually, everything is recording properly right now. Um, but uh, Representative Ortiz had mentioned uh, his town hall meeting on Tuesday and that is our That's special our meeting, meeting for our interview for our vacancy but our meeting does start at 6 and that doesn't start till 7 maybe tomorrow you could send me if you would like to attend because I could get a, I need to get an add out of three more and you plan on jetting from here over to the Civic Center to attend this town hall meeting okay so it's really important because you can put me down okay you too me okay too. Okay, so I'll just do the end. <laughs> I'll just run the ads. <laughs> and I'll make sure yes. that it doesn't matter how many. And you know. I'll make sure our meeting lasts three hours. <laughs> <laughs> and that'll solve that problem. That's just one topic. It's just one topic. We only have the two candidates. Um, tomorrow at five is the deadline, so, so it is possible to get six more tomorrow. So, but uh, otherwise, uh, it should be pretty short. They'll do you do a little interview process for each candidate and then we'll do tallies around the table and we have scheduled an executive session if anybody wants to discuss that and then we can come back out and do more voting if you want. But that's all I have. City Attorney. Nothing, Your Honor. Future agenda items. I have two. I think we need to have further discussion about insurance for boats in the harbors. I know this is going to be a topic at boats and harbors. The other one, Your Honor, is very early next year. I would like to see what the proposed transit plan from Ward Cove to downtown is. I want to know. I want like to have a discussion and settle on a fee, and I would like to get the plan codified and in place early in the year so that everybody that's going to be impacted by this can come and see us and voice their concerns or their comments, their potential solutions to problems that they may see with it. But I would like to get out in front of this so that we're not having this conversation the last week of April. That's going to be way too late. I don't know if it's an agenda item, but I would like, actually, I have a question and um, 
a request to the council to look at the ordinances on shutting off people's um, electric in the winter or when a bill is um, okay so here's my here's my little thing um, person gets an overdue um, having a hard time makes an effort to make a payment is short $38.48 and they still get shut off so I want to know what the policy I know they were overdue but they made an actual effort to pay what they could but they still got shut off so then they come back and they have to get turned on and they have a $675 um, reconnect fee over $38? Yeah. Plus the bill that's due on the 15th of November. So I want to see what our, what the actual rule of thumb is. And I don't know, but I think that considering the weather, the fact that some people's electric is their heat, their bill is going, so most, a lot of times, the bill for those people with the electric heat are between three and four hundred dollars, then add the sewer water and um, other um, s utilities, and they have a, a five, six hundred dollar bill. Um, I know a lot of other places have a no shut off policy for April to when the weather starts getting warmer. I believe we do have a similar policy, but we will prepare a report that outlines what the actual policy and uh, municipal code limitations are and how we address uh, late payments and shutoffs. We'll, we'll get all that together. So then, just, yeah, and then just to put into there too is um, how many people are we, do we have working answering phones for individuals who call in but we're on and I know during the pandemic things were crazy and I will forward the letter to you guys but um, how do we need more customer service staff at KPU to make sure that when people do call in because they're having a hard time they're actually getting called back or they're not getting missed um, and that's a different we can get all that information I mean, I'm just, we have an island of 14,000 people, so I know we have like five people that probably answer the phone, and I work in a call center. So I, I, I'm already doing the math, and there's no way. <laughs> so. I hope you're all 14,000 are having problems. Right. <laughs> I hope if they not. are, we've got a bigger problem than, than yeah. the call center. <laughs> but I'm just saying that. <laughs> Any other agenda uh, items? Mayor and Council comments. Uh, Mr. Baton. It was a tough, tough session today. I think we addressed a lot of issues. We have a tough road ahead of us. I think as we work together, we will come up with the solutions that the citizens of the city need. Also, I think approving the RFP process for hiring a city manager, I think we need to take our time do due diligence both for the utility and the city and get the best of the best and not just settle. So let's take our time for that process. That's all I got, Your Honor. Mr. Gass. Uh, I agree with Jay. There's, there's definitely a full agenda today. Uh, of all the different things, though, the one thing that I guess I would say I'm probably most concerned with is this issue whether you want to credit it to homelessness or drugs or crime all those incorporated uh, and I I did want to just go ahead and say uh, once again publicly that I guess to say I was wrong because uh, last year when we were trying to cut the budget you know I thought the best move would be to freeze those police positions and uh, I think the last 12 months has been a pretty strong. Uh, we've, we've kind of got a taste of our own medicine on that and uh, I don't think that was where we want to make our cuts. That being said, we are, you know, 
we're going to be hurting somewhere. Uh, if we hire three new, if, if we fill those police positions, we're going to have to figure out where else to get it from. But uh, learn from our mistakes, and, and I think, you know, we keep asking kind of, well, what can we do? What can we do for the officers? What can we instruct the officers to do? And I think it all, the reality of it is they need more bodies. So, uh, you know, definitely live and learn on that. But uh, also, I think it's important that we do say, you know, it's unfortunate to move them around, but I think we, we need to give the police department credit. A month ago or so, we were all really upset about the situation down at Salmon, down here. Birth three. Birth three, thank you. And uh, that's been really cleaned up. Obviously, there's more of a problem, but I think it's better than it was. So I do want to give them a credit for uh, doing what they can with the resources they have. I think they're doing a decent job. And uh, to be quite honest, it's it's a bit of a slap in the face, or, or I should say a wake-up call to the community that we now have a bank robbery. So hopefully these issues start to get resolved. But that's all for now, because my iPad says 10 o'clock. Okay. Ms. Bradley. Um, I just want to say thank you to Lacey and the team. Um, Lacey in particular, she's uh, running solo and looks to be running you well, gotta thank them without too. an assistant, yes. <laughs> no, everyone gets a thank you, but um, I know there's a lot going on, and just thank you for chugging along. Um, we're trying, trying to find avenues to help. Um, and secondly, I'm, some of you already saw, but uh, AMO, again, yay, 30 days later, another raise. Um, so now we're close to almost 30% in 30 days, you know, from January 1st to January 31st. Um, it's getting awfully scary um, for just the basic needs, and that's obviously going to have a huge impact on our services as well in a lot of areas. And so um, just making sure everyone saw that today. Um, I don't, there's nothing, I don't think we can do, but still. We'll see. Ms. Ziggy. I think I've said enough this evening. <laughs> We're done. I'm done. Ms. Gage. Yeah, um, I think, you know, I think staff does a great job and I, I appreciate everybody. And um, I think that with uh, everything going on, um, the homeless people, that, and I've worked with these people myself, and, and um, playing devil's advocate sometimes works to get the attention that it needs to be. <laughs> but uh, I think the understanding um, we're gonna we're running into where our housing is becoming even more unaffordable across the board, and that's just going to impact this even further. Adding food, thirty percent on um, barging stuff in. I'm ready to go shopping in Canada again. <laughs> there was a time. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a long time. <laughs> But um, I think that it's going to take a huge uh, effort from the entire community. Um, I don't know. I'm a little frustrated with, with the AML. Is, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. If you're not careful playing devil's advocate, you'll get burned at the stake by the mob before you have any, before you can say, no, I've just, that wasn't me. Too late. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just, just to address the point you, you raised, um, there are discussions going on between several of the Southeast mayors to see if there's anything, anything we can actually have also talked to uh, state representatives uh, about that. And uh, unfortunately, Juno right now seems to think that it's just uh, a it's, trend. Well, it, it, they think it's not AML's fault. So we, we we're having some issues with, with, with those folks. But, um, the other cities in the Southeast, I think, are aware, aware of where the problem's coming from. As, as staff told us a year or so ago with, the, with the, some, some of the other shipping stuff, too, you know, and, and this is where it's going. Hopefully we don't end up being, being like uh, our brethren in northwestern Alaska that have empty shelves and high prices because nothing ever gets in. And that, that, that's a real worry. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a real worry. Um, also, I, I just want, wanted to remind people um, that um, uh, we need to be very, you know, 
it was good that we had some good spirited discussions tonight. We need to keep it, keep in mind we need to focus on ideas and not individuals. And once again, you know, if, if you're here, shout, shout at me, and I'll I'll pass it on. But, but just in just just in general, you know, we we need we need to be focusing on what we can do to make things better and not you know getting mad at each other, which sometimes happens. Sometimes happens. Um, gosh, I was going to call for a motion to adjourn, but I guess we think think of session, don't we? And this is really, this is really important. It's really necessary. Oh, I'm calling. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So I was bouncing around here. I totally forgot. Um, so uh, just thank you to the manager and the finance director for all the work you guys did on this agenda tonight. That's all I have here. Didn't you know the vice mayor is 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 Republican? Noy. Take me and Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that went out over the uh, <laughs> uh, so, so he, he's, he's, he's sleeping here tonight. Okay, um, unfortunately we have an executive session. Um, is there a motion? Your Honor, I move the City Council declare that consistent with the acting city manager's memorandum dated October 25th. 2021, it is in best interest of the city to discuss strategies relative to negotiation of a new collective bargaining agreement between the city of Ketchikan and the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 1547, to replace the existing contract that expires expires December 31st, 2021, in executive session. In accordance with that finding, the city council go into executive session in accordance with Ketchikan Municipal Code 2.04. Point zero two five a one to discuss said negotiations and the auxiliary items described in the acting city manager's memorandum, which which matters include the need to discuss subjects the knowledge of which would have an adverse impact upon the finances of the city and upon the city's ability to negotiate favorably labor agreements. So good. <laughs> you know, we actually had a discussion a while, you know, several years ago about making those those smaller and, and for a while they were and now they're kind of like creeping back up again. Yeah, 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 I think I think you know I think we need to we need to look at that again. Okay. And the trees came out of the week. Okay. Typical roll. I've got it. Oops, uh, oh that's right, that's right. I'm first to have a skin. That's right, that's right. So he gets to go home early, or do we yes. get to sit out here? So be here with right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I, 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 I think he needs to stay out here. No, uh, Mr. Gass may get may go home early. Flora. Yes. Matani. Yes. Gage. Yes. Ziggy. Yes. Bradbury. Yes. Thank you. That's five. <laughs> so let's uh, all adjourn into the chamber of horrors. Uh, you, you don't need to. And good lord, why are we here for four and a half hours? Three and a half hours. I'm sorry. We're back on. You are. Doing the public business. Okay. Um, we heard a report from staff regarding. Uh, Labor discussions, and we gave direction. Do I get to be the move to adjourn guy this year? Whoever wants to yeah, move to adjourn. It's <coughs> my order. You're only on the meeting. Yeah, sorry, sorry, it's, it's unscrewing here. I got it. Back to the gallery. We need to come back to thank you. Oh, because I don't mean to be. We'll have a fight. We're all wearing red green hats. Or we can just stay here. No, I think that's it. I used it.